Hello everybody. Uh, in this lecture, lecture, I'll talk about an important special sense, which is the sound or hearing. You know that we have two ears and those are the peripheral organs of hearing. And we can hear the sound in 360 degree. That means from every angle around us. Uh, therefore, sound has more, you know, uh, advantage over the visual system because in case of visual system, your visual field is limited, right? Our eyes are frontally located, so we have a range in our visual field. We cannot see behind that. However, in case of sound, you can even hear the sound if the sound source is behind you. So that is an advantage of sound over our vision. Okay. Anyway, uh, as you know that all sensory systems consist of two parts, the peripheral organs or parts and the central part. Peripheral part or organ uh, are the structures where the receptors are located. For example, for your vision, the peripheral organs are your eyes, two eyeballs, and the receptors, visual receptors, are located in the retina of the eye, right? So, uh, the photoreceptors are located in the retina. In case of your auditory system, the peripheral organs are your two ears. Okay, we'll talk about the anatomy of the ear as well as how the ear processes the sound, how the sound is processed in the peripheral organs. Uh, first, we'll talk about the stimulus. As you know, that for the hearing, the stimulus is the sound and sound is actually a mechanical stimulus created by any disturbance in the space. For example, if you know you hit something or you rub something or when you know you vibrate your vocal folds or vocal cords, those create waves in the air, right? And the waves in the air travel and the air waves can travel in water, in air, as well as through the solid structure. So the waves can travel not only through the air, but also through the solid molecules as well as through the water molecules. However, most of the time we hear the sound that travels through the air. So that's why we say that air waves enter into the ear of the listener. The person is listening. So this is the ear and sound waves enter into the ear. And sound waves travel longitudinally, not transversely or horizontally. Sound waves move longitudinally and what is the difference between the transverse and longitudinal waves? If you see uh, the transverse waves, the molecules move perpendicular to 
the direction of the waves so if this is the direction of the waves like this okay the molecules move up and down this way okay so that is the direction of the movement of the molecules so you see sound wave moves this way but the molecules move up and down that means perpendicular to each other a good example is waves in the water when you go to you know uh, the six flags you know in hot summer you uh, go to that you know water park and you see many people are sitting uh, you know in the water and the waves are coming right and waves come one after another and if you look at all the people floating you know uh, there you'll see the waves are moving like this way and the people who are floating they are moving like everybody is moving like up and down if you look everybody when the waves are you know uh, coming everybody um, is like moving up and down right so that is transverse movement however sound waves um, are longitudinal waves that means what the molecules move towards the same plane of the direction of the sound waves for example in the air if these are the sound waves okay the molecules also move like this like this okay so displacement of the molecules will be you know same direction of the sound waves okay and when you you know create the sound waves in the uh, in the air what happens some areas the air molecules get compressed that means the density is high and then next area is less compressed okay so the density of the molecules is low and then again next area is highly you know compressed this is how the sound waves create um, the areas here the molecules are compressed here compressed here compressed okay and in these areas not compressed so if now i measure the pressure in this area the pressure is high this area pressure is low this area the pressure is high this area is low this area is high makes sense right so high 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 low low so that's how the sound waves are created and travel okay and the molecules move like this way okay um, and we say that sound is expressed by sinusoidal waves and the pressure changes the as i mentioned uh, the sound can travel through the air as well as through liquid and solid where the molecules are more dense the speed of sound is faster a metal here and put your ear here it will travel fast through the metal okay if you create sound waves in the water and listen here it will be slower than the solid however through the air the sound travels in you know uh, low speed lower than the solid and liquid in air the speed of sound is 340 meters per second in water much faster you see 1500 meters per 
second and solid it depends on what kind of you know uh, metal or solid material is that depending on that the speed varies okay uh, another good way to you know explain the transverse and longitudinal waves is uh, you know the kids play with structure that is called slinky and if you take a slinky and someone holds in this side and another you know kid holds here and then if this person moves up and down okay then the waves will be like this so this is the transverse right and now if you just you know pull and push pull and then leave then it will be stretched and then will recoil right and move movement will be this way okay so this is the longitudinal and this is the transverse like this okay three important uh, components of a sound wave or uh, three important components of uh, the sound are intensity frequency and another is called timber quality okay so intensity is the loudness the pressure so sound pressure is the intensity and that is actually expressed by how loud that sound is okay and frequency is the number of waves in one second so waves per second how many waves in one second okay and the frequency gives the perception of pitch high pitch sound means high frequency and low pitch means low frequency okay uh, as you know that male voice is loud but low pitch and female voice is high pitch that means high frequency but less loud so these are two different things okay and timber indicates the quality of the sound okay so those are three important properties of the sound now uh, how many waves in one second how we can you know uh, measure the waves we measure the waves from peak to peak or trot trot like this from this peak to this peak is one wave okay and it indicates the complete you know circle so how many waves are here in one second that is the frequency so one two three four five six so i'll say six hertz this is the unit hertz is the unit of frequency okay uh, and as you know that human audible sound is 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz that means 20,000 hertz right however uh, you know after mid age this upper limit uh, you know declines pretty quickly and you know uh, older people they rarely uh, listen the sound above 10 kilohertz okay the our our uh, you know uh, ability to listen high frequency sound declines a lot 
okay and this distance is the wave length okay wave length so if the wave length is short that means the frequency is high if the wave length is long frequency is low okay <clears throat> and amplitude is the intensity or pressure so this is the frequency how many this way we count and amplitude is the height which indicates the pressure you remember I mentioned high pressure area is like this uh, so low pressure area is this this is low pressure this is high pressure right so if I increase the pressure this amplitude will go up amplitude will go up. okay so amplitude indicates the intensity or pressure okay and frequency is indicated by the number of waves so now you can see that the frequency can can be same but the intensity can be different in these two you see two waves are here right so this is a complex sound which has two waves and this lower one and upper one that means low intensity and high intensity both you know sounds have same frequency but the pressure or loudness is different okay okay so the areas you remember I mentioned that high pressure areas the molecules are you know uh, densely present those areas are called the compressions of the air molecules and in between the compressions you see less dense molecules and these are the areas called rare fractions okay so those are two areas and this is high low high low high low high okay now we can actually uh, say that these are all simple sounds because you see only one type of sound waves so all these four are simple sounds however if you see that the frequency of this one and this one is same okay however the amplitude of this one is more than this one that I explained in last slide so and now you see uh, this one has higher frequency but same amplitude of this one so these two um, the upper one and lower one the loudness or you know pressure or amplitude uh, is same but the frequency is more in this one than this one okay this person uh, is a very famous scientist uh, his name all of you know I believe is Alexander Graham Bell and he uh, first uh, you know uh, was able to transmit the sound from one place to another place that became became the telephone um, so he is the inventor of telephone uh, and he also you know uh, invented many other things including the braille reading for the blinds x-ray also he you know um, is one of the uh, pioneers of uh, you know uh, the invention of aeroplane so he worked uh, in many different fields of science uh, however he is um, known as the father of you know uh, telecommunication you know the Bell company uh, is named after him and 
he uh, actually uh, also you know invented the sign language uh, so many different things and when he died uh, you know the telephone uh, in all North America was uh, silent for one minute was kept silent for a minute okay okay so we already talked about the loudness and pitch okay uh, human audible sound as I said that 20 Hz to 20 thousand Hz that means 20 kilohertz and the sound below 20 Hz is considered as infrasonic some creatures they can communicate uh, using infrasonic sound however we don't listen and uh, the sound frequency above our upper limit that means above 20 kilohertz is considered as ultrasonic you already know some creatures they communicate uh, using the ultrasonic sound okay so here you see this way is frequency 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz and this way is actually showing the pressure y axis is so showing the pressure and this is the frequency so see that uh, human ear starts to feel pressure and then eventually pain uh, when the pressure goes above a certain limit so intensity when the intensity is very high uh, we feel pressure in the air and eventually pain in the air Uh, here uh, in this picture you can see two things one is the range of our ability to listen the sound and in this part is showing the range that we use to produce the sound so two different thing right one is listening another is producing the sound so you see here human we usually you know uh, when we produce speak or produce speech we use very low 85 to 1100 hertz okay uh, frequency sound so when we talk we use uh, pretty low frequency sound however we can hear the sound all the way up to 20 kilohertz that we mentioned here this one so 20 kilohertz 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz right so the our ability to hear the sound is this range but our the emission or production of sound we usually use uh, this range and you can also see other creatures okay and you see here uh, bat you see bat uh, can listen very high frequency here 100 hertz that means 100 kilohertz uh, sorry uh, 100,000 hertz that means 100 kilohertz so way high than the human ability to listen the sound they also communicate uh, using very high frequency sound so which we don't see uh, uh, you know produce so they produce the sound much higher uh, frequency than the human human uh, sound is produced by an anatomical structure located inside the larynx larynx is called the voice box why because inside the larynx this is the larynx in your throat and inside the larynx you have the vocal cords okay so before we produce the sound we you know set the vocal cords 
in certain you know uh, stiffness and then uh, we you know throw the air from the lung from the lungs to outwards and that air hits the vocal cord okay and the frequency of sound will depend on the stiffness of the vocal cord okay if the vocal cords are more stiff then uh, the frequency will be higher if less then frequency will be lower anyway so that's how we you know produce uh, the sound uh, uh, in different you know uh, pitches as well as different loudness pure tone and complex tone so uh, these are simple sounds so pure tone sounds because you see only one you know frequency fixed this one higher frequency this one lower frequency but the uh, there is only one type of waves however in this one if you combine these two together these two frequencies together then you will get the complex tone so pure tones are produced by one type of you know uh, frequency however complex tone is formed by uh, the combination of two or more different frequencies okay so if we combine these two a and b we'll get this complex tone and what is important is that in nature all the sounds we listen or experience are complex sounds you cannot really you know uh, experience pure tone which is impossible because even if you are sitting in a very quiet you know room where you think you are not listening any other sound uh, except one the music you are hearing but actually you are uh, the sound waves uh, that are entering into your ear uh, are the combinations of many different sounds some sounds you you know don't even realize but you know uh, the electricity or you know uh, the shower or the tap is on or the you know um, uh, cars are moving outside all those sounds are always you know uh, getting combined together to form the complex sound so in real world we cannot experience a pure tone um, we uh, in the lab to uh, create pure tone we use the you know soundproof room to study uh, the individual the effect of you know individual uh, pure tones on the brain functions or neurons however still the sound we create we um, you know significantly uh, remove uh, the other tones but uh, which is close to pure tone but uh, may not be exactly pure tone it is very difficult to uh, say that we are able to create pure tone even in a soundproof room however um, you know uh, to study the neurobiology of sound it is very important that you use the soundproof room and all you know uh, auditory neurophysiology labs have soundproof rooms because uh, we want to study the neurons uh, the properties of the neurons uh, and which neurons are sensitive to which frequency tone or intensity to study that we definitely need to create the pure tones right uh, for example this is neuron a is sensitive to this low frequency sound and this is neuron b is sensitive to this high frequency sound right how we we'll know that we have to present the stimulus right and record from the neuron activity of the neuron if you see this neuron fires when we present this one that means this neuron likes sound b frequency right and when we present this one this neuron will fire or show activity okay so uh, we have uh, some neurons uh, those are sensitive to pure tones but we also have some neurons those like the combination of two different 
sounds, uh, sound waves. So those are, you know, uh, the neurons like the complex sound, combination sensitive neurons combination sensitive neurons so this is actual recording and you can see uh, the uh, sound is a pure tone uh, and because all waves are same height this one you see as well as the frequency you see here the complex sound where you have multiple different frequencies Okay, um, the spectrum. Spectrum is a representation of the relatively re relative intensity uh, present at each frequency. Okay, the spectrum is a very useful, uh, you know, uh, method to separate different frequencies at different intensities so here you see that uh, this is a pure tone that you saw before and the frequency this way is the frequency right so you see you can just you know uh, represent this frequency and this is a low frequency so this is the frequency here okay and the intensity is this way Okay, so this one has high intensity but low frequency. Make sense? So it is this way, it is close to here, low frequency. Now this one frequency is high but intensity is low, right? So as the frequency high, it is this way more but intensity is low. That means the amplitude is short, small. Okay, so this is the spectrum we uh, represent or we present the sound uh, you know uh, frequency against the intensity okay so this is a complex sound it has two different frequencies right and two different amplitudes so you can see now this is the way how this uh, spectrum is uh, you know placing or uh, plotting this complex sound you see it has one low frequency and one high frequency low frequency intensity is high high frequency intensity is low okay so this way we can uh, you know present uh, a complex sound in the spectrum and um, Fourier analysis is a very useful uh, method to analyze the complex sounds and uh, we use the spectrum to do the Fourier analysis to separate different uh, components of sound and plot them okay so uh, I already explained that how dodge how dodge sound uh, sound energy travel so uh, this is what I told you uh, the slinky right if uh, you like uh, you know pull uh, from both ends and then leave the way the uh, you know rings move that is the way the sound waves travel so that is longitudinal so <clears throat> this is longitudinal this is transverse uh, waves I already talked about the density of the molecules and the speed of the sound. Okay, now I'll talk about the anatomy of the ear. You know, the peripheral organs are the ears, and human ears are placed in both sides of the skull or head. Uh, so temporal uh, locations that means laterally and if you see the part of an ear ear has three parts one part is called the 
outer or external ear and external ear includes two structures basically this part that you see from outside is called the auricle or pinna auricle also known as pinna and this part is called the external acoustic meatus or outer ear canal so it is like a tube right <clears throat> now auricle um, is a highly elastic organ that means formed by elastic tissue elastic type cartilage elastic cartilage and that's why you can you know change the shape twist it bend it and when you remove the pressure it goes back to its actual shape and the outer rim this part of the auricle is called the helix and this part you see here this is called the tragus and these are concha the folds okay anyway so it is uh, a highly elastic organ or structure and it acts like a funnel to capture the sound so the sound waves you know travel in the air and is captured from different directions sound waves you know arrive and uh, they are captured and funneled into the external acoustic meatus or outer air air canal and if you see the external acoustic meatus um, inner surface is waxy that means oily secretion which is known as ear wax you know that right and uh, that wax actually is secreted from the glands located around the external acoustic meatus and the oily secretion which is actually fatty acid uh, in nature and that secretion is called serumen serumen and these glands are called seruminous glands sebaceous gland like glands and they secrete the wax or serumen okay and uh, this secretion is actually very helpful uh, for a number of you know reasons one is dust particles since this is like oily sticky secretion dust particles will be trapped here will not be able to go to the inner part of the ear number one number two uh, this secretion has bactericidal action can inactivate the bacteria or kill the bacteria and other microorganisms and uh, number three it repels the insects like ants or you know small insects if they try to enter the smell will repel the insects so uh, those are the protections given by the external acoustic meters now at the end of the external acoustic meters you have a very extremely thin drum that is called the ear drum okay so uh, the eardrum 
is extremely thin and if you see the parts of a eardrum um, it has two parts the upper smaller part which is uh, more flexible and that is called the pars flaccida so this part is more soft and flexible called pars flaccida okay and it is actually uh, loose areolar tissue type connective tissue type connective tissue okay however most part of the eardrum is formed by dense tough connective tissue and this part is called pars tensa okay which is formed by dense type connective tissue dense irregular this is one type of connective tissue where the fibers are heavily packed irregular okay connective tissue okay now another thing if you see the layers in the you know pars tensa uh, it has three layers in it although it is extremely thin as i mentioned still it has three layers in it the outer most layer is a cutaneous layer that means like a skin so this is the cutaneous layer and middle part is fibrous layer middle fibrous layer layer and anyway it's not working here fibrous layer and innermost layer is another type of structure that is the mucus layer so this is the mucus layer outer cutaneous skin like middle fibrous and inner mucus layer so that is the eardrum okay and when the sound waves you see hit the eardrum since it is extremely thin it will vibrate okay and in the other side of the eardrum you have the ossicles in the middle ear so middle ear is a cavity inside the temporal bone so that's why we say middle ear cavity in that cavity you have ossicles how many three three ossicles ossicles are tiny bones okay like uh, the size of uh, a seed of orange and three ossicles malleus incus and stapes okay so here uh, in this small cavity you have three ossicles those are tiny bones okay and they are attached to each other like you know their shape um, is different from each other but they are articulated or joined to each other and <clears throat> the first one malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane right and the last one is attached to the vestibule of the inner ear so we'll talk about that later just know that um, middle ear is a cavity in the inside the tympanic bone and it has 
three tiny ossicles okay so when the eardrum which is also called the tympanic membrane is the ear drum okay vibrates and when the eardrum vibrates that also you know vibrate those three ossicles because first one is attached to the eardrum and uh, actually chain of ossicles right so this is the eardrum so all these three ossicles will also shake or vibrate and they act like a liver to amplify the sound pressure okay so the sound pressure will be amplified will be intensified in these joints okay and then you have the inner ear okay and the structure that is attached to the last ossicle which is the stapes is the oval window it is an opening but there is a membrane here this is called the oval window okay so now something interesting here you see that the sound pressure from the tympanic membrane or eardrum travels through the you know um, uh, sound waves travel through the chain of ossicles and then shakes the oval window the membrane in the oval window and when the sound goes from this mechanical pressure goes from the tympanic membrane to the oval window it is uh, you know intensified uh, at least 10 times two mechanisms one i mentioned the the ossicles act like liver and another is this is the tympanic membrane or eardrum which is much bigger than the oval window right so when you know you put pressure from the large surface to the smaller surface the pressure will be much higher here okay so this pressure from here to here uh, um, travels and much more pressure is created on this small surface and that is extremely important because in the other side of the oval window you have the fluid not air and to move the fluid here in this side you need more pressure to move the air you need you know weak pressure but if you want to move the fluid and create waves in the fluid you need much higher pressure or intensity right and that is the function of the middle ear the ossicles okay and the size uh, of the tympanic membrane and the oval window okay now uh, there are few ligaments to hold the ossicles in right locations as well as two muscles tiny muscles are present in the middle ear and those two muscles are very important because those muscles prevent too much movement of the ossicles now when the ossicles would try to move vigorously when you you know your tympanic membrane receives very loud sound like you know some blast produced very you know loud sound uh, very close to you that sound uh, will hit the tympanic membrane very strongly and that would move the ossicles would try to move the ossicles you know a lot which can displace the ossicles however because of those two tiny muscles uh, the ossicles cannot move too much okay so that is a protection so what are those two muscles uh, prevent excessive movement of the ossicles and give the protection 
one is called the tensor tympani and another is the uh, stapedius okay give protection and uh, you know if the ossicles get uh, uh, separate from each other separated from each other this uh, amplification of sound pressure will not occur and the person will uh, you know uh, not be able to listen the sound uh, another uh, thing that can you know uh, reduce the sound pressure amplification in the through the ossicles uh, sometimes what can happen the ossicles the joints may get like you know uh, fused with hard tissue calcification or excess bony tissue can be formed and that would reduce the you know movement at the joints and that will reduce the uh, you know um, amplification of the sound so the person may not listen or uh, may you know the ability to hear would be reduced uh, significantly and that condition is called auto means ear sclerosis okay and um, another condition that happens due to infection in the middle ear that can also uh, reduce the you know uh, ability to listen the sound uh, that is called otitis media middle ear if i say otitis uh, external that means infection in the external ear so otitis media infection in the middle ear okay so uh, let me quickly go over outer or external ear consists of the auricle and external acoustic meatus these two structures right and then you have the tympanic membrane uh, which is actually a partition between the outer ear and middle ear so this is the tympanic membrane here ear drum and in the middle ear uh, cavity you have three ossicles few ligaments and two tiny muscles and i explained those right and then the inner ear the most important part of the ear why because the receptors sound receptors are located as well as other important receptors are located in the inner ear okay in the inner ear three structures are very important cochlea a snail shaped coiled bony hard bony structure filled with fluid so this is the cochlea okay and the sound receptors or hair cells for the sound are located inside the cochlea so this is related to the sound because the sound receptor cells are here inside the cochlea then you have vestibule and semi circular canals three semicircular canals those are tubes half you know round tubes okay so vestibule and semicircular canals both are responsible for balance and equilibrium and they can detect the acceleration the motion vestibule can detect the linear acceleration linear motion okay it could be horizontal or vertical and semicircular canals 
are placed in a way inside the ear there are three that they can detect the rotation in any direction okay so uh, when you rotate your head in any direction uh, that can be picked up by the receptors located inside the semicircular canals okay so remember that all these three structures cochlea vestibule and semicircular canals they have the sensory receptors okay in the epithelium sensory epithelium and those receptors uh, in the cochlea can detect the sound uh, uh, and the vestibule linear acceleration and semicircular canals rotational acceleration okay or angular acceleration so uh, those are three very important structures and from these three structures the nerve fibers get out and form the cranial nerve number eight which is called the auditory nerve okay so cranial nerve number eight which is the auditory nerve okay and it has the fibers some of those fibers are carrying the sound signal and some are carrying the acceleration okay so two totally different types of functions so here you see the inner ear uh, and this is the cochlea vestibule here and semicircular canals here so you see all those structures in the inner ear okay Uh, the last structure here this is the structure called the auditory tube also called eustachian tube or pharyngotympanic tube auditory tube is the most commonly used one auditory tube and easy right uh, also called eustachian or pharyngotympanic tube uh, you see one end is in the middle ear and the other end goes to the nasopharynx to the pharynx the uppermost part of the pharynx and this auditory tube actually uh, you know uh, maintain maintains the pressure equalize the pressure inside the middle ear so if the pressure in the middle ear increases the air pressure some here we'll get out through this tube to the pharynx okay okay so you just go over these few slides so you can get uh, say the three ossicles we talked about those and this is the inner ear so this is the cochlea snail shaped hard bony structure filled with fluid and contains the sound receptor hair cells and this part is called the vestibule and these are the semicircular canals okay now uh, first i'll talk about the cochlea so you already know that cochlea is a coiled snail like bony structure right and here is the oval window and you know the step is the last ossicle is attached to the membrane in the oval window okay and vestibule is here then the cochlea so this part is the cochlea and this is the vestibule and the cochlea and vestibule are filled with fluid right so just let's talk about the cochlea so cochlea is filled with fluid now inside the cochlea you have two types of fluid and three chambers we'll talk about that 
just know that uh, the whole cochlea is filled with fluid it is a fluid filled structure okay we'll uh, try to find where the receptors the hair cells are located to understand that you need to do what since it is coiled what i will do i will make it straight you can do it you can make it straight it's like a coiled tongue now if you just you know uh, make it straight and see inside you will see two mammals okay two members that means two partitions separate the cochlea into three cavities right all three cavities are filled with fluid okay so those are the cavities scala vestibule scala media middle cavity and scala tympani is the lowermost cavity okay and these two members are vestibular membrane and basilar membrane so vestibular membrane is the upper one and lower one is the basilar membrane and they separate the cochlea into three cavities scala vestibule scala media and scala tympani okay and these three cavities are filled with fluid okay and a structure lies on the basilar membrane that is called the organ of corti okay so now what i'll do i'll just make a slice chop this and take this slice out from here make sense so now if i just only see this part take out this part and see here what i'll see i'll see the vestibular membrane the basilar membrane right and three cavities filled with fluid okay and the organ of corti a very important structure here rests on the vest uh, basilar membrane okay so this is the vestibular membrane this one is the basilar membrane okay and this fluid in the top cavity and the bottom one same fluid called peri lymph okay so this is also peri lymph and the middle cavity scala media contains a different type of fluid and that is called endo lymph endo means inside endo lymph okay the difference between the peri lymph and endo lymph is in the endo lymph fluid you have more potassium concentration of potassium is much higher okay as well as you have calcium okay then the peri lymph peri lymph has more sodium like you know extracellular fluid in your tissue in the body where you have more sodium outside than inside the cell okay and here you have more uh, sodium less potassium makes sense here you have more potassium less sodium okay this is very important this you know uh, potassium high concentration of potassium in the endo lymph okay now let's see this structure rests on the basilar membrane it's called the spiral organ 
also called organ of corti okay why this is a very important structure inside the cochlea because the sound receptor cells those are called the hair cells okay are located inside the organ of corti so these are the hair cells okay now if i just you know see here you can see uh, scala vestibule or vestibular canal scala media or middle canal and scala tympani or tympanic canal and this is the basilar membrane here and this is the organ of corti so you can see the organ of corti here okay now uh, if i see uh, the organ of corti this is the basilar membrane this is the organ of corti right and these are the hair cells there are two types of hair cells outer and inner hair cells okay and you have the hair at the apical or free end these are the hairs here like this okay and there are another type of cells called the supporting cells uh, just to support the hair cells but hair cells are the sound receptor cells another very important structure is a soft jelly like membrane that is called the tectorial membrane which just rests on the organ of cord like this so this is the tectorial membrane okay it is like a soft jelly like structure tectorial membrane okay and uh, what happens you see the hair of the hair cells are attached or inserted into the tectorial membrane which is soft okay and the oval window is here so let me just you know draw the cochlea so this is the cochlea and when the oval window shakes shakes or vibrates like this waves are created in the fluid make sense in the cochlea so the waves are created here in the fluid also here first created here and then also here so the waves in the fluid will move the basilar membrane up and down make sense and that will push the hair cells against the tectorial membrane this is the tectorial membrane that soft jelly like membrane and these are the hair cells you see these are outer hair cells and this is inner hair cell and when the basilar membrane here you know moves up and down the hair will you know press the tectorial membrane so the bend of the hair or bending of the hair will occur make sense so the fluid will move and that will move the basilar membrane and the hair will press against the tectorial membrane and that will cause what you see this is just one hair cell and now if i see more microscopically these are the you know cilia or hair and the tallest one this is called kino cilia and these smaller ones are called stereo cilia 
okay and from the kinocilia spring like structures that you know go to the other cilia stereocilia and here you have the ion channels they are normally closed however when that you know fluid moves the this way if the fluid you know moves the stereocilia this way what will happen you see these are called these spring like structures are called tip links okay so these are tip links and see the pressure of the fluid uh, will create a shear shearing force okay and that will move the kinocilia that way make sense also this is stereocilia this way and the tip links will stretched and when the tip links are stretched they will open these caps on the cilia stereocilia so these are like caps and will be pulled by the spring and when the caps will get opened what will happen you see i told you in the <coughs> uh, fluid you have more potassium right in the endolymph you have high concentration of potassium right as well as calcium so what will happen when the channels will get opened due to you know uh, pressure in the tip links uh, the potassium and calcium will get in so positive ions get in okay and that will cause the depolarization depolarization of the hair cells okay and here in the bottom part of the hair cells you have the vas cycles filled with glutamate the neurotransmitter okay glutamate excitatory neurotransmitter okay and, and the calcium will do what calcium will bring the vesicles and fuse them to the cell membrane and will rupture so by exocytosis glutamate will be released here and here you have the axon okay this is called the calyx axon terminal and when the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate will be released here that will excite this axon action potential will be created make sense and will travel that action potential okay and here you have a ganglia ganglion is singular ganglion and this is called the spiral ganglion okay and inside the ganglion you have the cell bodies of these neurons so we'll come here and then axon will take it out okay so there are two types of neurons inside the ganglion uh, some neurons are bipolar okay that means they have dendroid and axon some neurons are pseudo unipolar only one long axon pseudo unipolar okay so whatever uh, just know that these are two types of neurons located here and from the hair cell when the glutamate will be released you know action potentials will be created uh, excitation will be created in uh, the, uh, the you know neuron here and that will travel towards the central nervous system and this fiber is the auditory 
nerve fiber called the cochlear because it is coming from cochlea cochlear nerve fibers okay so that's how uh, you know the action potential is created in the hair cell and gets out from the hair cell and uh, uh, become the electrical signal that travels towards the brain makes sense and uh, we'll stop here and we'll talk about uh, the central part uh, how the signal is uh, you know uh, taken to the brain in next class thank you